Hi history lovers and welcome or welcome back to the channel where I bring you new videos every Friday. Today on History Calling we've reached the 11th video in my Tudor Monarch series and the second looking at the life of Elizabeth I. This one will cover the tumultuous five years during which she was heir to the throne for her sister Mary. You'll hear how she became the princess in the Tower after Mary imprisoned her on suspicion of involvement in a revolt known as Wyatt's Rebellion and see the letter Elizabeth wrote to her sister as she frantically tried to save her own life. We'll talk about the security measures she took with this letter to ensure that no one could forge any additional comments on it and discuss a later planned revolt in which there was stronger evidence of Elizabeth's involvement. Most importantly of all, we'll ask, was Elizabeth I a traitor or was she wrongly accused? The answers are all coming up. When we left Elizabeth last week, it was July 1553 and her half-brother, Edward VI, had just died. What she didn't know was that just before his passing, this ardent Protestant had attempted to upend the will of their father, Henry VIII, by cutting their sister Mary out of the succession to prevent her from restoring Catholicism to England. What was more, despite having always gotten along well with Elizabeth, Edward did the same to her, barring her from inheriting on the grounds of her illegitimacy. Instead, he wanted the crown to go to Lady Jane Grey, who was the Protestant daughter of their cousin Francis Brandon Grey and married to Guilford Dudley, son of the Duke of Northumberland. The attempted coup, which I covered in detail in my third video on Mary from a couple of weeks ago, failed. Mary took the throne and Jane and Guilford were locked up in the tower. Elizabeth had been at her home at Hatfield House during the commotion, but now she came to London, arriving on the 29th of July, then going to meet Mary the following day, after which they entered the city together on the 3rd of August to scenes of joy from the populace. Whatever happiness Elizabeth felt though can't have lasted long, for soon she found herself in the position Mary had so recently occupied, that of heir to the throne and under pressure from her half-sibling to change her religion. The only difference was that where Edward had wanted Mary to become Protestant, Mary wanted Elizabeth to become Catholic. Elizabeth's reaction was very different to what Mary's had been, however. Where Mary had fully rejected Protestantism, outwardly at least, Elizabeth conformed. She asked her sister to give her teachers and books so that she might learn more about Catholicism, and she attended Mass in the Chapel Royal in September, though she complained the whole time that her stomach hurt. Mary was crowned on the 1st of October at Westminster Abbey, and Elizabeth and their former stepmother Anne of Cleves sat next to her at her coronation banquet in the positions of greatest honour. By the by, if you'd like to learn more about Anne or any of Henry VIII's other wives, I have a playlist dedicated just to them, which I'll leave linked in the description box for you. After the coronation, things began to deteriorate between Mary and Elizabeth almost immediately, and a report by the Venetian ambassador explains why. Immediately after the ceremony, she assembled Parliament and forthwith repealed the acts passed at the instigation of her father concerning the divorce from Queen Catherine, so that the marriage being declared valid, Her Majesty remained the legitimate daughter, the Lady Elizabeth being consequently bastardised, because born in the lifetime of the Catholic Queen. From that time forth, a great change took place in Queen Mary's treatment of her. For whereas until then she had shown her every mark of honour, especially by always placing her beside her when she appeared in public, so did she now by all her actions show that she held her in small account. This disquieting Her Excellency, she asked leave to go to her country house, and although some persons were of opinion that the Queen should have refused it, Her Majesty, not loving her, as she had demonstrated by very clear signs even in the lifetime of King Edward, granted the permission. Elizabeth left court in December, pausing on her way to her house at Ashridge to write to Mary asking for additional goods to furnish her chapel, but the Queen was increasingly sceptical of her sister's apparent conversion. Mary now began to arrange a marriage to Philip of Spain, the son of her cousin Charles V, but the prospect of England becoming a satellite to the Spanish Empire, along with her moves to restore Catholicism, rang serious alarm bells for many in her kingdom and caused a revolt known as Wyatt's Rebellion after one of its main leaders, Sir Thomas Wyatt. 
The plan was to have individual but coordinated risings in different locations around England and under the command of different leaders, including Wyatt and Lady Jane Grey's father, Henry, Duke of Suffolk, who Mary had only recently pardoned for his part in the attempt to put his daughter on the throne in her place. Once they had displaced Mary, Elizabeth would be proclaimed Queen and married off to her distant cousin Edward Courtney, Earl of Devonshire, a great-grandson of Edward IV. These two would then rule together. Details of the plot leaked, however, and the rebels were forced to revolt in January 1554, two months earlier than planned. Nevertheless, Wyatt did for a time put the capital and the Queen in danger, but Mary rallied her people to her cause and her men eventually defeated him at the beginning of February. Wyatt and Suffolk were arrested and sent to the Tower. Elizabeth would soon follow. Mary had tried to get Elizabeth to come willingly to court in late January as the revolt took hold, but she declined. As soon as the danger was passed, Mary refused to take no for an answer, and so on the 12th of February, and despite Elizabeth's protestations of ill health, she had to leave Ashridge and journey to London, arriving on the 23rd. She must have known the danger she was in. On the day she left her home, Lady Jane Grey and her husband Guilford were executed, despite having played no part in the rebellion. On the day she arrived in London, Jane's father, the Duke of Suffolk, paid the ultimate price too. Elizabeth was now held in Whitehall Palace, and Mary refused to see her. The evidence against the Queen's sister was circumstantial, but it hinted at her involvement in the revolt. Wyatt had been in contact with her prior to the rebellion, though wisely she hadn't replied to him in writing, and a copy of one of her letters to Mary explaining why she couldn't come to London sooner was found in the dispatches of the French ambassador. Wyatt was interrogated and eventually put on trial in mid-March, but he refused to implicate her. Still, he said that she had replied to his messages verbally, saying that she would act as she should see cause. The Queen's Council used this comment to formally charge her with involvement in the conspiracy, and on the 17th of March she was told she was to be taken to the Tower. It was at this point that Elizabeth, as she frantically tried to stall having to leave for the Tower, sat down to write perhaps the most important letter of her life. It's known as the Tide Letter because she wrote it in order to delay her departure by ensuring that the tide had turned in the Thames River, thereby preventing an approach to the Tower by boat. It was addressed to the Queen and reads as follows. If ever any did try this old saying that a king's word was more than another man's oath, I most humbly beseech your majesty to verify it in me, and to remember your last promise, and my last demand, that I be not condemned without answer and due proof, which it seems that now I am, for that without cause proved, I am by your counsel from you commanded to go unto the Tower, a place more wanted for a false traitor than a true subject, which, though I know I deserve it not, yet in the face of all this realm appears that it is proved, which I pray God I may die the shamefullest death that ever any died afore, if I may mean any such thing. And to this present, however, I protest afore God, who shall judge my truth whatsoever malice shall devise, that I neither practised, counselled, nor consented to anything that might be prejudicial to your person any way, or dangerous to the state by any means." And therefore I humbly beseech your majesty to let me answer afore yourself, and not suffer me to trust your counsellors, yea, and that afore I go to the tower, if it be possible, if not afore I be further condemned. Howbeit I trust assuredly your highness will give me leave to do it afore I go, for that thus shamefully I may not be cried out on, as now I shall be, yea, and without cause. Let conscience move your highness to take some better way with me, than to make me be condemned in all men's sight, afore my desert known. Also I most humbly beseech your highness to pardon this my boldness, which innocency procures me to do, together with hope of your natural kindness, which I trust will not see me cast away without desert, which what it is I would desire no more of God, but that you truly knew. Which things I think and believe you shall never by report know, unless by yourself you hear. I have heard in my time of many cast away for want of coming to the presence of their prince, and in late days I heard my lord of Somerset say that if his brother had him suffered to speak with him, he had never suffered, but the persuasions were made to him so great that he was brought in belief that he could not live safely if the admiral lived, and that made him give his consent to his death. I'm just going to pause for a moment to give you a little bit of context. Elizabeth is here referring to an earlier scandal in her life when she was suspected of having a relationship with her stepfather, the Lord Admiral Thomas Seymour. 
After trying to win control over his nephew, the young Edward VI, he was later executed with the connivance of his brother, the Lord Protector, the Duke of Somerset. You can hear all about it in my previous video on Elizabeth. The letter now continues. Though these persons are not to be compared to your majesty, yet I pray God that evil persuasions persuade not one sister against the other, and all for that they have heard false report and not hearken to the truth. Therefore once again kneeling with humbleness of my heart, because I am not suffered to bow the knees of my body, I humbly crave to speak with your highness, which I would not be so bold to desire if I knew not myself most clear as I know myself most true. And as for the traitor Wyatt, he might peradventure write me a letter, but on my faith I never received any from him. And as for the copy of my letter sent to the French king, I pray God confound me eternally if ever I sent him word, message, token, or letter by any means. And to this my truth I will stand in to my death. The portion of the letter that you see here is the second and final page, and it gives an insight into Elizabeth's paranoia that her enemies were trying to have her killed. Having used only a portion of the paper, but with nothing left to say, she scored through the rest of the leaf with thick black lines so that no one could make any incriminating additions to her missive, leaving just enough room at the bottom to write, I humbly crave but only one word of answer from yourself, and to sign the letter with the words, Your Highness most faithful subject that hath been from the beginning and will be to my end, Elizabeth. She succeeded in delaying her remove to the tower, but only temporarily. She got no response from Mary, and a few hours later she found herself in the building which has gone down in history as one of England's most famous prisons, and which to this day houses the bones of her mother Anne Boleyn. Elizabeth was even housed in the same rooms Anne had been in before her execution. She was interrogated, but just as with the Seymour affair, she admitted nothing, and her interrogators were blatantly unenthusiastic about their job, begging her forgiveness for having to question her. It quickly emerged that just before the rebellion, and apparently on the advice of Wyatt and one of the other rebels, Sir James Croft, she'd intended to move to one of her many homes, Donington Castle. This didn't look good. Elizabeth had apparently been determined to wait and see how Wyatt's revolt would play out from a strategically strong building secured with arms, and she hadn't alerted the Queen to any potential danger. Her denial of ever having received a letter from Wyatt seems very dubious. She was certainly in verbal communication with him through intermediaries, and to this day we don't know how a copy of one of her private letters to the Queen got into the French ambassador's possession, but we can't rule out the possibility that it was through Elizabeth. Nevertheless, there was no firm evidence of any wrongdoing, and Wyatt refused all the way to the scaffold, where he was sent on the 11th of April, to accuse her or Edward Courtney, exonerating them again just before his death. Finally, the worst danger was passed, and in mid-May, Elizabeth was released to house arrest in Woodstock under the watchful eye of Sir Henry Bedingfield. This lasted for almost a year, and although Elizabeth didn't get along particularly well with Bedingfield, it was nevertheless a comfortable enough confinement. She had her own servants to wait on her, including her cofferer or accountant Thomas Parry, and so she was kept informed of events in the outside world, despite this being against the terms of her imprisonment. She also wasn't literally locked up. In fact, Bedingfield complained that the huge house only had three doors that even could be locked, and she continued to conform to Catholicism by attending Mass, though she did insist on having an English Bible. Whatever Elizabeth's private religious beliefs, this was politically savvy. Mary had had England formally restored to Catholicism and papal authority at the end of November. By that point, she was also married, having wed Philip in July, and more importantly still from Elizabeth's point of view, the King and Queen expected to have a child in the summer of 1555. It was to witness this birth that Elizabeth was released from house arrest and brought to Hampton Court Palace in April. How she felt about this, we'll never know, but anything that made her obsolete to the succession and to Mary can't have been welcome news, and it would be understandable if she'd feared the birth of a replacement heir would seal her fate. She could hardly have guessed what would happen next, however. Having been left to alternately cool her heels at the palace for several weeks, or face pressure from Mary's council to admit her guilt in Wyatt's rebellion, she was suddenly called to visit her sister and brother-in-law in the dead of night on the 21st of May, and despite the fact that Mary was now in her confinement before the expected birth of her baby. Again, Mary tried to get Elizabeth to admit her guilt, and again Elizabeth refused. Her fate now hung in the balance. 
A new baby would spell disaster, but what actually occurred was so extraordinary that if it was written into a novel, I think it would probably be derided as a completely unrealistic plot twist. Mary, it transpired, despite showing all the symptoms of pregnancy, right down to saying that she could feel the baby kick, turned out not to be expecting at all. It was a terrible blow for the Queen, and one she held off admitting to until August, when she quietly left her confinement, but it made Elizabeth's position immeasurably stronger. It was now all but certain that she would be the next monarch, and everyone, including Philip, who soon left his wife and returned to the continent, could see it. After staying at court until mid-October, long enough to see the beginnings of the Protestant burnings for which Mary has gone down in history, the now 22-year-old Elizabeth was finally allowed to return to her home at Hatfield and to her servants and studies, without Beddingfield's oversight. The following year, there would be yet another attempt to oust Mary in her favour, and this time Elizabeth would play a more obvious role. In 1556, Sir Henry Dudley, a relation of Lady Jane Grey and of Elizabeth's later favourite Robert Dudley, entered into cahoots with Sir Anthony Kingston, Knight of the Shire for Gloucestershire, and a man who had recently been imprisoned in the Tower for resisting Mary's attempts to seize the lands of English exiles. The plan was for Kingston to raise the Welsh marches against Mary, while Dudley would invade with a French army. Mary would be overthrown and exiled, presumably to live with her husband, although let's be realistic here, she probably would have been killed, and the old plan of marrying Elizabeth to Edward Courtney, who was now in exile on the continent so that they could rule together, was resurrected. The French king, Henri II, was meant to help finance the whole thing, but changed his mind after signing a truce with Philip of Spain in February. This is where some of the most damning evidence for Elizabeth's involvement comes in. The French ambassador in London, a man named Antoine de Noir, was told by a leading member of the French government to ensure that, given the change in circumstances, Madame Elizabeth does not begin for anything in the world to undertake what you have written to me. The French obviously thought Elizabeth was in on the whole thing, and as the plot gradually unravelled and its leaders were arrested or fled, attention turned to her household, where a number of her servants, including one of her favourite ladies, Cat Astley, were also arrested and interrogated in May. Several confessed to knowing about the plot, and seditious, anti-Catholic, anti-Marian papers were found in Astley's possession. It's very hard to imagine that all this was going on under the nose of the famously clever and astute Elizabeth without her knowledge, and I think it's more likely than not that she was somehow involved, though it's impossible to tell to what extent. She was forcibly held in her house and once again protested her innocence, but she must have known that Mary now had enough to send her to the block. The Queen's reaction, however, was very unexpected. Though the evidence of Elizabeth's involvement in this plot was stronger than it had been in 1554, Mary chose, publicly at least, to support her sister. The reason for this unexpected show of sibling solidarity? King Philip. Mary relied on her husband for advice, despite the fact that his interests conflicted with hers, for his primary concern was always the welfare of Spain. As I mentioned a minute ago, Philip had by now realised that he would almost certainly never have children with Mary, and he calculated that after her death it would be better for his own kingdom if Elizabeth, Protestant though she was, was on the throne, rather than one of the other strong contenders, Mary Queen of Scots, who was destined to also become Queen of Spain's greatest enemy, France. Thus Philip advised leniency, and Mary I, ever the dutiful wife even when she was being used, complied. In June, she removed the guards on Elizabeth's house, told her that she thought her servants had acted without her knowledge, and sent her a diamond supposedly worth six or seven hundred crowns as a sign of her faith in her. I doubt she believed a word of it, but Elizabeth was safe and so confident that she effectively slapped Mary in the face by immediately refusing to come to court with only the weakest of excuses. There was a price for Philip's support, however, and it was marriage to a safe Catholic candidate of his choosing, specifically his cousin, Emmanuel Philibert, Duke of Savoy. This plan had been floated before, back in 1554, and Elizabeth hadn't warmed to it then. Now, renewed pressure was brought to bear on her to marry Emmanuel when she came to court for Christmas 1556. If she didn't comply, her sister threatened to have Parliament declare her illegitimate and recognise Mary Queen of Scots as her heir, 
both odd threats, I think, given that Elizabeth had actually been officially illegitimate since the age of two and Philip's known aversion to the Scottish Queen. Still, Elizabeth resisted with all her might, so much so that she didn't remain at court past the 3rd of December and seriously contemplated fleeing England with the help of the French. The pressure mounted further when Philip finally came back to England in March 1557 and there was talk that he planned to kidnap her and force her into the marriage. This came to nothing and Mary, despite her threats, was actually not in favour of the match either. This is because it would have assured Elizabeth the throne and this was a thought she constantly balked at. Not for the last time, a foreign prince would be frustrated when he tried to win the hand of Elizabeth Tudor. Any thoughts of a domestic marriage were fading too, for Edward Courtney had died in Padua in September 1556. Mary's power was now on the wane and Elizabeth's on the rise. The Queen convinced herself that she was pregnant again after Philip's visit between March and July 1557 and David Starkey posits that this is why Elizabeth visited court briefly in late February and early March 1558. It was to be the last time the two met, and just as before, there was no baby. Mary hadn't enjoyed robust health since her teenage years, but she now began her final descent towards death. By October the end was in sight, and on the 6th of November Mary finally acknowledged her sister as her heir. On the 17th she died. The news was brought to Elizabeth at Hatfield, where legend has it, and I'm afraid legend is probably all it is, that she received the news under an oak tree and responded by saying in Latin, this is the Lord's work and it is marvellous in our eyes. However she received the news, Elizabeth was, at long last, Queen of England. To find out what happened next, make sure you're subscribed with notifications switched on and join me again next week to hear about the first portion of Elizabeth's reign. You can also follow me on Instagram where my username is History Calling. If you like the tutors, there are links in the description box to additional resources, including books and movies, which you can look at to learn more. Or if you just can't wait, why not click on one of the end screen cards you see here to take you to either my Tudor Monarchs or my Six Wives of Henry VIII playlists. If you fancy something totally different, I'd recommend my video on the mysterious disappearance of Benjamin Bathurst. Let me know below if you think Elizabeth was guilty of treason, either in the Wyatt or Dudley rebellions, or if you think she was wrongly accused. Until next time, keep learning.